Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's special Meta Compliance web webcast. I'm David, and in today's show, we're talking about culture wars, or more specifically, how to create a strong culture of security awareness within an organization. And why does it have to be a big struggle to make that happen? And speaking of culture, or was it big struggles? Not really sure. Uh, let's meet our guests for today. Meta Compliance CEO and author of Cybersecurity for Dummies, Robbie O'Brien. Hello, Robbie. Hi, David. How are you? I'm delighted to be here today. And I'm delighted that you're here as well. Uh, and today's special guest, of course, author, instructor, advisor, and manager for security, culture, and awareness at Indeed.com. It's Lauren Zink. Hello, Lauren. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. Really looking forward to the conversation today. No, really, really looking forward to chatting with you. Uh, why don't you kick off by just telling us a bit more about you and your work? Yeah, sure. So I've been doing security awareness along with dabbling in a few other areas such as incident response, vulnerability management, um, policy and compliance. But I would say my passion is really in that human element, that human side of security. And I had to look before we got on today just to make sure, but I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Um, and like I said, security awareness, culture change. I think that it's an area we're going to continue to see grow. And I am so excited that I get to be part of it. Um, and I, I just love what I'm doing. I love being at Indeed. I think that there's a lot of room for growth and development of their program there. Um, and I look forward to talking a little bit about it today. Indeed. Fantastic stuff. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so Peter Drucker, if you haven't heard of him, he was one of the foremost business thinkers in the 20th century. And he wrote countless books on the, on the art and practice, practice of effective management. And The Effective Executive was one of his most famous books. Uh, the way many large corporations work today, in fact, can trace their roots directly back to many of his insights. And one of his most, getting back to the point, one of his most famous quotes is culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that's a good starting point for our conversation today. Uh, Robbie, how, how do you define culture within an organization, particularly around cyber awareness? And how is this different perhaps to an organization's cyber strategy? So I think um, strategy is, is, is more dynamic than culture. I think culture is changing DNA uh, strategy is, is changing uh, the way you, you do something. And it, it's actually something that uh, people forget because particularly when um, someone has had an incident and the general populace, particularly the leadership function is animated, they want change fast. They, 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 they really are in a, in a world of hurt and they want to go to a, a, a state of being that allows them to be more secure. And, and so, sure, it's easy to get people to uh, do the right thing. And what's happening is uh, hackers are, are relying on human beings to be humans, to have a day, you know, a bad day, to um, react emotionally to certain stimulus. And the reality is you're trying to change that. You're trying to make those things not um, automotive. You're trying to get people to just think for a moment. And, and that makes it really, really difficult. So in a nutshell, strategy is something that changes over time. Culture is something that has to be embedded, that's there every day, front of mind every day. And um, that I think... Is, is something that is a big, big challenge for organizations because this is new, it, it is relatively new. Lauren, when I, when I throw, the, throw the culture curveball or, or, or strategy over to you, how, how, do, how do you juggle those two? How do, you, how do you sort one ball from another? Yeah, so I think, you know, creating a strategy is something that you can kind of do from the get-go, but like, you know, he said, 
creating a different culture or changing a culture or seeing a shift in that takes time. It's not something that can be done overnight. It, you know, you've really got to dedicate a lot of time and a lot of resources to it. And you've got to make sure that you're measuring it. So if you're just saying that you're changing culture, but you have no way of measuring it um, to really show that shift, then are you truly changing the culture? Or are you just giving people things that they need to do? Um, you really want it to become a habit, not just at work, but also in their personal lives. Um, so that when they see these risks that present themselves, they, they know what to do with the risks. And I think that's truly changing culture again, not just at a company, but with individuals themselves of understanding what to do with those risks. That's really interesting. So Robbie, you spoke of culture as a kind of DNA thing there. And Lauren, you spoke about uh, about habits, about creating good habits. It, it's about it's about Robbie, I guess, the the default behaviors. If something happens, if if an incident, whatever kind of incident occurs, then what is your what is your instinctive response to that? Uh, and is is culture something with kind of training that instinct that that knows for knowing what the right response is without getting the rabbit in the headlights or, or maybe you know going off and doing something which isn't as per corporate policy or you know, would be ill advised otherwise. One of the things that has been surprising to me, um, and, and if you take this into account with what you've just said as well, is, is the concept of shame. And, you know, I think if you take it to uh, automobiles and, and motor cars, uh, if you have a prang, you know, um, nothing, you know, you, you, you reverse into a supermarket trolley or something. Um, with your your new car or or your partner's car, and uh, it's sh- it, your immediate feeling is, oh, I want you know, um, how am I going to get it fixed? Your immediate feeling is is you've let let yourself down, and so that that feeling that feeling of um, sort of loss of control, and and if if anybody has had a, a, a an incident, a serious incident, I mean, it hits you in the stomach. Um, it is stomach loosening completely. So you get reactions from people that are really not typical. Um, and uh, I had an example recently where uh, a very high profile uh, cyber breach um, with ransomware at a national level, uh, the problem was that people panicked and basically turned the computer off, uh, you know, unplugged it, turned it back on again, haven't that isn't that what we've, we've been taught for the last 30 years of how to fix it when you ring the, the help desk and they can't get so many they say right reboot your machine well that's what they did but unfortunately the code and the ransomware didn't accommodate this as a, as a as a potential outcome and everybody that did it those 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 computers were dead and even though they got a way to get the keys to release the ransomware um they lost at least 25 percent of their estate Big, big problem, um, as in no coming back, completely dead. And, you know, who would have ever thought that? So you go, well, how could you have stopped it? Well, um, you need to tell people, you need to train them. You need to train them, you know, Ghostbusters, who are you going to call when this thing happens, really? And, and it's, it's in those joins beyond, uh, which is the journey that, that I think most companies are on trying to accommodate these outcomes and uh, provide their users with regular front of mind responses, automatic responses. Incidents um, are, are the thing that is where culture meets reality. And um, I think the vast majority of organizations have, will, will have problems with that for the next 10 years. It's funny you talk about those those incidents and that that ransomware outbreak that you spoke of there. Even if people have got maybe a bit of an idea as to the right way to respond to that, whether that's you know rebooting your PC or not, all it takes is is one bit of misinformation. Is somebody from accounts to say, "Oh no, aren't you supposed to turn your machine off when that happens?" And that little nugget of misinformation can spread like wildfire in the right kind of environment. And that and that's another thing that I guess culture the culture war that you have to try and fight against uh, lauren i'll swing this one back to you you know robbie shared an experience of a of a cyber incident what 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 experiences have you had of of cyber incidents where culture 
maybe has or, or maybe has not played a part in, in its being uh, well managed? Yeah, I think where I've seen that is, and typically when I'm looking for a job at a, like, you know, a company or a corporation, I ask, am I going to have direct connection with the security operations center with other teams within the organization that are seeing the incidents in real life and what's going on in our environment? And if they say no, then I know that that's probably not somewhere where myself or the program can be successful. Because what I found is if we are incorporated into things like those tabletops where we're doing that hands-on planning and simulation and training, um, it's more successful for us to know how are people going to react? What can we do to be more proactive against the threats in the first place? And how are we going to communicate the narrative should something happen? Um, and I think that it's important that security awareness should not just be siloed by itself. It needs to be, you know, in every single piece of security, but also in groups outside of security as well. Um, and I think that that just helps create that culture across the organization um, so that people do understand what to do should an incident occur. What is the argument then for organizations where they, you know, you, you say, oh, yeah, I need to have good visibility of the SOC, for example, or other yeah. departments. What's the argument for those organizations that go, nope, sorry, nope, <laughs> we're not going to let you have access to or, or, or play this mediation role between these vitally important uh, parts of an organization when an incident occurs? That seems crazy to me. Yeah, I think there's a few things I've seen where people just don't want to share the information. They want to hold it close to the chest. They feel like it's kind of, you know, secretive. It should only be with certain people that have certain access or certain roles within the organization. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, if we can't communicate and be transparent across different different groups and different roles, how can we be successful? Um, I've also seen where maybe they say, well, you're more the human side. Do we really need to pull that into more the, the technical side of things or even the policy side of things? But truthfully, we all have to work together to make sure that we're preventing those incidents and we're doing what we need so that, again, we can shift that culture. Um, the siloed approach of we've got technology, we've got processes, we've got people, we need to be you know, crossing all of those throughout the organization. I've seen that before where it's the attractiveness of plausible deniability. Yeah. If, if you don't know about it, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we can give, get away with giving out the minimum of information and uh, we'll sort of some way you know, sneak our way through this, uh, and I, I think that's that's organizations who might be uh, longstanding but are not very mature in the realities of how bad these things can get. And, you know, I think we're, we're more and more coming to a situation where you have a defined uh, time limit with which to declare your hand. Um, and that is an almost impossible situation if people are holding back on you thinking I, I'm going to determine how much you're you're given uh, to tell, you know, mm -hmm. shareholders or press or, or whatever. Uh, and, and that I think is quite rightly something you should body swerve in a big way because um, it's a recipe for getting the blame. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, typically in organizations you haven't seen where security awareness can really play that role when it comes to incident response. But I do think that they can serve as a really great liaison between you know, the, the incident response team and communications and legal, because you have someone that really understands both sides of the spectrum and they can take that content and really turn it into something that's easily digestible, but still maintains the information that needs to be maintained. Um, sometimes when it goes from incident response directly to corporate communications or legal, you lose some of that, that content that needs to be shared. So um, maybe it's not typical to organizations, but I think it's going to continue to go in that direction. Let's talk about, well, maybe about about silos and particularly some of those challenges with larger organizations and you know one one definition of of culture which is our word of the day is one where individuals feel empowered to take responsibility for results and that's not always an easy thing in large organizations you know i've i've worked in in the big companies as well and individuals can sometimes feel able to hide away in the crowd to kind of blend into the background while the big corporate machine moves forward almost irrespective of their individual actions. Lauren, you've worked in big organizations in the path in the past as well. And what are the ways that you've seen culture change stick for employees to kind of inspire this sense of individual responsibility, particularly in large organizations? 
Well, I think it starts with making sure that you understand the existing culture within the organization. So maybe not the security culture, but what's the general culture of the organization? Can you piggyback off of that and make sure that you align your security awareness cultural shift with what the culture within the organization is to begin with? I also think it's important that you make sure that you take a pulse, um, whether it's through surveys, focus groups, whatever it is, so that you can see what do people know, what do they have an appetite to learn, what do they think currently, and how, if they think currently that we're at A, how can we get from A to A to C, what do we need to do? Um, and that's not something you can just do once, it needs to be on an ongoing effort, um, and you can really use that information to drive your program um, in the right direction, because if you've empowered the people to give their feedback, and they're seeing their feedback implemented in the program, um, then I think that it really, you know, it helps you to get buy-in, and I think another thing that really helps with buy-in is truly doing that role modeling from the top down. Um, because if you see and you're telling, you know, executives are saying, you guys need to do this, you need to do X, Y, and Z, but they're not doing it themselves, um, then it's confusing. It's just like, you know, I've made the analogy before as a parent, if we're telling our kids, you can't do this, but we're continuing to do it. We're mo role modeling for them and they see it and they think, well, it's okay because mom and dad do it. Um, so if we see executives, for instance, let's say going into an office environment and they're not wearing their badge, they're not using their badge when they go in. Why, you know, it's hard for us to continue to kind of pound it into people and say, you need to wear your badge. You need to make sure that you um, are using it every time that you walk in. Again, that role modeling, I think, is, is really important. And you have to have that buy-in from the top level to really change that culture. A few things there. Um, first of all, that understanding the existing culture, you know, you can't, you can't manage something until you can measure it. How, yeah. <laughs> how do you, how do you quantify uh, culture within an organization? What, what what are your starting points there to enable you to get a gauge as to what the A looks like if, so that you can make the best journey, chart the best course of getting it towards B? So I think it's understanding your environment and the risks that are in your, that are in your environment and affecting your environment, and then being able to demonstrate that people understand what to do with those risks and showing that those risks have continued to go down, or at least the report rate for those risks are changing. Um, and another way that I also do it is looking at what are the risks just for that general area? And I've, you know, say this all the time, it's really hard to quantify your return on investment when it comes to security awareness. It's not something that's super easy to do. Um, what I really like to do is try to quantify it with cost avoidance. So if we are doing these things from a security awareness, training, communications, education, cultural perspective, then we can avoid certain things, these certain risks, these certain incidents, um, reputational damage, loss of customers. Um, and so that in turn, and I think Robbie said this before, um, can actually be quantified with ROI. Um, so I think looking at those real world scenarios with other companies and how it can affect us is also effective as well. And that's an, another way of looking at that is understanding what the why is. This is why this this matters uh, and why we're all going to be going on this journey together. Yes. And I think communicating the why with everything you do is important because if people don't understand why you're doing it and they think you're just doing it to check the compliance checkbox, then they don't really feel invested. But if they understand that there's a lot more to it than just we need to do it, but we want to do it. This is why we want to do it. This is what it does for you. Then I think that it's a lot more impactful. And Robbie, we've spoken about this before, you know, it's, it well, or, or is it knowing about how to wield both the carrot and the stick? Because you know, there are those there are those big sticks of you know ransomware attack and uh, and whatever else that that people are aware of and kind of put the frighteners on people. But it's knowing what those carrots are as well. They're all part of this why that Lauren speaks about. Having a good grasp on all of those is quite an important tool, I guess. Oh, totally. Um, the why is it for me also is is front of mind um continually not going to go away not on a flash in the pan it's not because we have a personality that's driving it it's because this is you know part of the wallpaper in this organization and i i, I think the, the the why is a consistency issue that 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 you make happen um going to the carrot and the stick uh, as i mentioned earlier I have noticed a change in a number of, of um, very large customers. Um, and it really has to do with the fact that people have recognized that we sort of have gone to DEF CON 2 in, in relation to cybersecurity. You know, if you look at Twitter or some of the, the, the social feeds on, on cybersecurity awareness, 
um, from time to time you get people saying, oh, you can't uh, berate people into um, taking cybersecurity awareness. It has to be inclusive. You have to uh, cajole people to come along. And, and I agree with that. That's absolutely right. But in cybersecurity, there is no concept of, you know, someone uh, in a finance department failed a simulated fish test five times, six times, seven times. When do you call stop? And, and then I know the answer to that, which is, well, you put them on um, intensive training course. Yeah. But what happens if they still do that? And, and interestingly, um, a customer that I know, very large customer uh, in the transport industry, uh, because their, their, their critical infrastructure has said that if, that if you fail uh, a, a simulated fish twice, you get a written war warning. And if you fail it three times, then it is gross misconduct and you're fired. Now that happened, wow. that happened about say two months ago and their uh, sort of click through rate on phishing has dramatically <laughs> decreased. So you need carrot and stick. And, and I know it isn't very popular, but organizations are going back through their supply chain and saying, by, and supply chain is absolutely ruthless. There are clauses in contracts, which is if you don't meet these, these standards, you don't get to, to, to um, supply to us. Lauren, I want to come back to something that you mentioned a moment ago about role modeling and you know this kind of top-down, bottom-up approach uh, and about having senior leaders within an organization demonstrably, very visibly uh, towing the line when it comes to security practices. Are they wearing a badge when they walk through the front door, for example? And that that's a that's one example, but very often, particularly in larger organizations, you don't get to see senior leadership very often. You know, they might work in a different building to you, particularly as we're all working from home now. So I'm interested in any ideas that you have, and Robbie, I'll come to you on this one as well, about how to elevate the profile of leaders and, you know, see them, that the rest of the workforce can see them visibly um, cheering on security in all of the very obvious ways to be that role model that a large organization maybe culturally needs them to be. Yeah, and I think there's things that are typically already in place that you can hopefully piggyback off of. If you have an all hands meeting where your whole organization is there, seeing if there's, whether you can get your CEO or your CFO to do a plug for security, you know, oh, did you see that phishing test? Or, you know, if your CISO is on there, let him do it. Um, if you can have slides at the beginning of the presentation that maybe says, you see something, say something, whatever your slogan is for security awareness. I think that there's different things that you can do. If you have a company-wide newsletter and email that goes out, how can we as a security program piggyback off of, again, those existing communication you know, areas that we have, but from a senior level, how can we get the CEO to say, I've, I've clicked on a phishing email. It's okay. Like it happens. We understand it. This is what we need to do. It's very important that we don't continue to do this. Um, and if they can really demonstrate that they're human too, and that they also get these simulations and what they do when they get them, I think that that, that really can help drive the understanding of if the CEO can do it, I can do it too. Robbie, top tips for getting senior leadership visible in this realm? So um, I think newsletters and uh, town hall meetings are like that's that's table stakes that's mm -hmm. you have to do that um and, and and it's easy it's it's really easy f you know to have a statement that is passed through this uh, the ceo's office i think that e in, in this scenario uh getting your senior leadership to record pieces to camera again scripted mm -hmm. uh nothing more than a hundred words where they're basically saying, you know, we depend on you. We need to do it. Um, I have to do it. Um, you know, please see it as part and part of parcel of our culture and, and having all of the leadership team sort of cycle through that. Um, a, the fact that they're involved in creating a piece of content, they have ownership of it personally. Um, and I think that it actually really resonates with ordinary people that actually that's my that's that's one of my my senior leadership there and and i can see them and they're talking about it to me mm -hmm. um I, I have found that to be very very powerful but here's the thing you just don't do it one year and then you're done mm -hmm. and, and that's 
it is, I think, one of the things about uh, awareness, unfortunately, is you've got to keep it fresh. Um, we live in the YouTube generation and, and uh, like, I'm as bad as anybody else. It, it, you know, you, you've got the attention span of, of a fly and, and if you, it, it isn't good, you just flick past it, right? Or you, you do something else. So it has to be fresh. It has to be, uh, you know, constantly changing and, and it has to be uh, relevant to the, to the people that they're talking about. So you got to get your leadership team and your management team signed up to for the long haul that um, we're going to do one of these a quarter. We're going to, you know, split it out between different people. Um, and this is, this is what you gotta, you gotta sign up to and, and, and provide me with this level of, of, um, of effort. And if you get that, I think you're at best practice at the minute, but I, I think front and centering this as a uh, non-mandatory has to be done part and parcel of doing business uh, is, is where it's at at the moment. Yeah. And I think the ask for that, you know, five, six years ago from your senior leadership was a lot more difficult. Yes, I think now, because you do have representation on the board, typically when it comes to what they want to talk about security, or they want to do those hands-on exercises, or they want to do the tabletops at that level. Um, so if they're willing to do that and listen to that, they should also be willing to ingrain it in their everyday message that they're putting out for the company. Um, and I think, again, that's an easier ask than it was a few years ago because it's top of mind for companies now organizations that that get it um i guess there are a few good practices a few good characteristics that they that they present that that they do and uh, and one of them um i know you're particularly fond of is is the tabletop exercise just just chat us through how they work and and how they're particularly helpful in trying to ensure that the organization is as ready as it can be uh across uh, across the board when it comes to a cyber incident. Yeah, I think those tabletop exercises, those hands-on simulations where you actually get to walk through an incident. Again, you can't you can do many of these tabletop exercises, but you can't plan for every aspect of it. Um, but I think it's very eye-opening for leadership because they get to see you know, your analysts, what they're doing. They get to see, you know, what different groups within the organization are doing. They get to see all the moving parts that go into what would happen if, let's just say, this specific incident occurred. Um, and I think if you take that and then you show them, okay, this incident occurred, this is what we did, and then this is the impact that it would have had to the company if this actually happened, it's very eye-opening for leadership when that, you know, that really starts to transpire for them to see that. It's impactful because it's it's real life. It can really happen. It's happened to other organizations that are similar to yours. And if you can also kind of leverage those lessons learned, I know people don't like that, that using that fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, but they're true. It's true things that have happened to companies. And I, I think, why don't we leverage that? We don't need to, you know, how it and say, you know, this is going to happen to us. Um, you know, a lot of times people say it's not the, the if, but the when. Um, but I think that if you can leverage those incidents and what they've learned from them, why wouldn't we? Um, I think that it's, it's a great opportunity to use that. Um, and then I think where security awareness can also play a role in that is helping control that narrative. So you have an incident how can we control the narrative of what that looks like going beyond that? Um, because there is reputational damage that comes with incidents. Um, and I think that security awareness can play a huge role in that. And like I said earlier, not something you typically see, but I think it's going to continue to catch on. But another thing as well, going back to, you know, seeing these scenarios unfurl in front of you is the communications part. And that's something that I wanted to talk about because a key part of incident response is communications, whether that's regulatory, you know, communicating to whichever, um, you know, whether it's the information commissioner's office, if something's gone wrong. And indeed, for um, ensuring your reputation is as undamaged as possible, communicating with, with the media, com communicating with the press and, and with customers as well. What have you learned about the right way of communicating with customers in the event of an incident? And also, and the thing that I really want to get to is how technical those communications people can be, because I'm sure we can all think of 
uh, incidents, high profile incidents that have taken place where a high profile person, C-suite person, however, from the organization has gone in front of the me- in front of the media and has been eaten alive because mm-hmm. they're asking them questions that they just aren't equipped technically or otherwise to be able to respond to. So just, just talk to me a bit, Lauren, about the communications piece there and how to get that right when yep. when creating an incident management um, process. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've kind of alluded to this already, but security awareness, I think being part of that, if security awareness is kind of the group that handles your communications internally, when it comes to reporting different awareness, different, you know, measures when it related to the security organization, why wouldn't you also leverage them externally? Um, Obviously they have that somewhat technical background, background, they understand the risks um, and they're able to take that information and make it so that it's not super generic and that it still holds that, that kind of technical feel to it without it just being stripped down from communications and legal. Um, And I think that that's important because when you just have a somewhat generic spokesperson that goes out there and speaks on something, you can lose a lot of that narrative that you were initially trying to push out. And I think that that's very important um, that security does control the narrative when it comes to an incident Um, because things can be misconstrued. They can be, you know, poorly communicated. um, And then what happens with that is it, it hurts your reputation even more. So you already have reputational damage from this incident. If you don't communicate it well and it doesn't really resonate or it doesn't you know check all the boxes that need to be checked um that can do more damage than it does good and of course the other comms challenge coming back to security awareness within your organization it's trying to get the attention of your workforce robbie isn't it you know because we're all being bombarded with uh, different different surveys we were chatting about those earlier on uh, and different bits of the company who were trying to get our attention trying to get them to engage with us how as a security awareness function do you try and also get a bit of my attention so i i think there's two pieces of that how do you communicate with your staff uh, or communicate with the key uh, stakeholders in an incident when there's an incident, because one of the, uh, I think, uh, mistakes that people make is they expect everything to be in this state, as in, I have access to my system, I have access to the internet, all these things. When in actual fact, you have to assume that all these things might not be available. Um, And so therefore, you know, again, who you're going to call, how how do you keep that communication? going we've all heard the the stories about uh you know in previous incidents someone uh having a whatsapp group and then retiring and deleting the whatsapp group and suddenly there's an incident and no one can get anybody because no one has anybody's uh personal telephone numbers and have you ever tried to get someone's telephone number in europe i mean it's almost impossible now right um and, and then how do, how do you use maybe other uh, methods of communications like Teams, uh, which is becoming a more dominant form of communication or, or Slack in, 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 in a lot of our organizations. But I think for me, every uh, sizable organization's incident response is unique to them. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the people that should be notified, uh, what you want to happen in your organization. And, you know, that has to then be uh, front and center for everybody so that they know what they should do. I've always found that if you're relying on that to take a ticket, literally take a ticket and join the queue behind someone whose printer is broken and wait for the call center or the support center to, to pick up on it, the chances of you hitting a 72 hour deadline is impossible um, because you've just taken it into, you know, a, a, a level one support situation, which has to go to level two, which has to go to level three, which has to break out into an escalation uh, process. Um, and everybody is going, are you sure, you know, try and get them back and clearly you can't get them back because they're out of circulation because something bad has happened. And I, I think that's probably one of the um, key overlaps between incident management and awareness is actually creating um, either playbooks or uh, training or uh, having a defined policy which with a flowchart for people to easily understand this is what you should do, at the very least with, with, with management and senior management, because that's where everybody is going to run to. What should I do? This bad thing has happened. 
um, and you want to empower people to be able to move it along and, and, and respond in a really agile manner. It's funny, I can think of uh, one major cyber incident that took place last year. Actually, no, sorry, wasn't necessarily a cyber incident. Uh, I'm not sure that was confirmed, but a uh, major social network their staff couldn't get into the data center to fix the problem because their security badges stopped working <laughs> as a result of the incident that was uh, unfurling in front of them. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> back to culture and a slightly different angle on it. You know, the, the, the first rule of comms is to, is to know your audience and, and an angle on culture that we haven't touched on yet, Robbie, um, is, is, well, you work, you operate in meta compliance all over the world. Um, what, what examples do you have of how understanding the cultural context of your audience is important to make sure that your cyber awareness message, message sticks for that audience? So I, I think that there is such interconnectivity across the world now, um, particularly in, in technology where it's quite common for there to be multiple development centers in, in uh, South America or Asia or Europe. Um, and, you know, we struggle to deal with the languages. And so that's number one, you have the languages. Um, and if you get to sort of 14 to 16 languages, which is a lot of languages and a lot of effort to, to localize, really you've got 70% covered because it's in the smaller um, uh, levels of, of uh, need. And, and I'm not going to say any language because the minute I say some language, someone will say, well, well we've got a development center in, in this country and, and uh, you think it's not a very good language. And, and indeed, I find that with uh, localization strategy, it sometimes feels like a game of whack-a-mole where you think you have everything covered and it pops Oh, but we've got you know ten thousand people in this particular area, and, and and they need they need this training, and then you say, well, how many um, you know pieces of library need to be <laughs> need to be translated? Then it's everything. Obviously, it has to be everything, but that's only one aspect of it because we take that from a let's say a, a really diverse Western uh, a focus. But once you move outside of um, the West, that's they call it, you you come into then real um, different challenges with, with, those, um, with those local cult cultures. Um, interestingly, we've been uh, recently asked for a um, India only uh, set of training because the two things, one is, is it, it, it would get greater uh, engagement and, and adoption through um, development centers and manufacturing plants within the subcontinent. But secondly, where we are focused on protect the organization, culturally, they are interested in protect the family, protect your extended family, mm -hmm. and also protect the head of the organization. So that it's patriarchal in that it's protect the boss. They, they have uh, much more respect for senior leaders than, than I'll just say in Ireland, for example. Um, and so you go, well, that's not really that. Is that really a big difference? But if, if you're looking for engagement and you're looking to change that culture, well, you have to take into account culture. Um, and that, that is really challenging. But the bigger the organization, the more you know, spread out their user populations, the more this is a real, real issue. Uh, take China, for example, exactly the same type of, of challenges. And you know, there, there are huge investments in, in, in uh, people, in facilities, in, in, in these areas. Um, and the last thing you want to do is give them a piece of uh, training that is, you know, aimed at a, an American or a, 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 a European audience and for them to be, you know, not really that connected because it's, 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 it's somewhere else, isn't it? And at the end of the day, it's about human beings. So love them or hate them. That's, that's just the, the nature of, of, of this beast. It's, it's multifaceted and, um, and, 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 and very challenging. So I, I think that um, that's an evolving thing as we, go, as we move over time. Um, you, you'll find that uh, different uh, user bases will start to find their own, their own, um, their own uh, approach to what culturally gets them to be more vigilant and, and, and change behaviors more. 
Yeah. And I think one thing that you can kind of leverage is if you have it creating that security champions or ambassadors program where you have kind of boots on the ground in those different areas, different regions, different um, cultures so that you can say, Hey, we're creating this training. Do you think that this is appropriate for your culture here? If you have someone in China, can you take a look at this? What do you think we can change so that we can adapt the training to tailor it more to what's appropriate for you? Um, and that's just a way to have an extension of your security team because you can't be everywhere and know everything, um, but you can leverage people that are willing to kind of volunteer their time and be part of that champions or ambassadors program and help you so that it is impactful and successful. You're totally right, Lauren. In fact, where this this, this uh, change for us is coming from is, um, you know, senior managers in these other regions are coming back to our, uh, let's say, Western customers and saying this needs to change because right. um, my guys aren't aren't too happy with it, and and so it's actually the user populations for us that are driving the change. But I think your idea of of having local ambassadors as a as an asset test is, is, is an excellent idea. Yeah, it's good to flush out to, to make sure that there's nothing that may be deemed inappropriate because I've actually run into that where we've created something yes. and it got approval, it was great. And then we pushed it somewhere else and they're like, uh, over here, that doesn't translate as well. Um, yes. So that's where it can be helpful as well. We, we, we've done a number of uh, conversations, David and I, about humor, which in uh, Western <laughs> culture is, is a fantastic way of getting engagement and uh, guess what? It doesn't travel uh, too well. And, and so therefore, viewer discretion is the only way that you can actually uh, cover it off. Absolutely. For those that love it, they love it. And for those that don't love it, well, you've sort of warned them not to, to go near it. And, and we're not talking stuff here that is, you know, um, X-rated or anything that would be yep. deemed. I mean, it isn't something that would even give you a laugh. It's, it's, yeah. it's a, maybe a wry smirk is yeah. what we're talking about. It, yeah. But still, it, it's, it's people are very sensitive about this. And, and um, it, it sort of is a natural barrier to getting engagement and adoption rates across uh, multiple geographies. Yeah, there's no and one. Tastes, yeah. tastes change over time, particularly with, sure. with with comedy as well. Not that the content that you're creating now will be sitting on the shelf for uh, for that many years with the rate of change. But speaking of time, we are almost out of time for today. So uh, I suggest that we wrap up today's Culture Fest with some quick take, ho take homes. Uh, Lauren, I'll come to you first of all. Uh, what resources uh, have, have helped you and that you think might help our audience today to deliver cyber awareness campaigns and, uh, and culture change uh, where it is that they work? Yeah, so I think the first thing is learn your existing culture within your organization, build off of that, um, and make sure that you listen to your employees. Um, as a security awareness individual, make sure that you never stop learning. The adversaries, the cyber criminals, they're continually, continually evolving and learning. Um, so make sure that you are taking courses, reading daily, um, and that you're challenging yourself to keep up with those adversaries. Um, leverage your network if you have a network. If you don't, build one. Um, there's so many subject matter experts out there that are willing and eager to share their experiences and their wealth of knowledge and you know, awareness and culture, it can be so important and it is impactful when you do it right. And I think we're just going to continue to see this area just grow and develop. Um, so if it's something that's of interest to you, find a position, see if you can get the job. Um, it's really a very rewarding position and I don't think that anyone would be disappointed if they joined. Great take homes. Robbie, anything to add? I think that um, in terms of getting points across and, and, and delivering it, for me, there's a couple of, you know, uh, backbone issues, and that's policies. I think uh, we 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 touched on them a few times, but I think for organizations, start writing down what it is that matters to you. Start writing down in clear English that people can understand, because sometimes we rely too much on simulated phishing. We rely on on training, and that's that's yesteryear. It's gone. People can't access easily these learning management systems, but the policies front and center, um, particularly in relation to incident management, I think uh, revisit your incident management policy and I get it out there as, as a matter of urgency. It, it would be something that might actually give you real leverage in the event of, of, a, of a data breach. And then if we're talking about cul uh, culture change, for me, it's, it's personalization. Um, the more that you can have the training resonate with, with your teams, um, with your leadership, uh, with with your tribe, I think the more that you will get people to actually 
sit up, pay attention and um, change their vigilance behaviours. Well, thank you both for sitting up and paying attention today. Uh, and I hope everyone uh, has been doing the same as we've been chatting away. We are out of time for now, though. Uh, Lauren, where can people find out more about you and what you get up to? Yeah, I would say LinkedIn would be a great place to start. I'm very active on there and I've got a lot of my content that I share on there. So go ahead and find me on there and connect or follow. Yeah, but build that network as, as you suggested. Uh, and Robbie, I'm sure your Cybersecurity for Dummies book is high on cultural content too. High on cultural content. It's the focus of the book. It's a easy to, easy to use approach for um, people who are trying to implement cybersecurity awareness change in their organization. And uh, like uh, Lauren, follow me on LinkedIn and uh, follow Matter Compliance on, on uh, Instagram. Fantastic stuff. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Lauren, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This is great. And Robbie, good to see you again. Look forward to seeing you all next time. But for now, bye-bye.